Chapter 9, Patient Assessment. When we're looking at patient assessment, we're always looking at what's going on around us. Okay. Always performing a, a scene sizer if it's an accident or injury or illness. We always look at the patient, what's going on around the patient. Are there any signs of what's happened to him? We perform a primary assessment. Is he alive, dead, life threatening in, in injuries or illnesses? Um, and then levels of consciousness, obviously. We obtain a patient's medical history. We perform a secondary assessment, which is a head to toe from the top down to the bottom, and we perform a reassessment. Our initial assessment is always your baseline vital signs and things. And then when we come back and do a reassessment, we check in to see if we are actually winning the game and whether the patient is doing better or not. The skills and uh, knowledge uh, represented in this chapter follow an assessment-based care model. The treatment rendered is based on the patient's symptoms. And assessment-based care requires you to conduct a careful, thorough evaluation of the patient. Obviously, when we start, patient assessment sequence provides a framework so that you can safely, there's the important word safely, size up an emergency scene, conduct a primary assessment, obtain patient history, conduct a secondary assessment, and conduct a reassessment of the patient. Sometimes we will never get to do a secondary survey. In the situation where there's cardiac arrest and you need to do CPR, you might not get to do a secondary assessment. You would just start off. The primary assessment established the patient is not alive, not breathing, and begin doing CPR. Or if there are positive signs of death, we will not do anything. We wait for help to come. Um, dispatch information, we obviously need the location of the incident, the main type of the problem of the incident, the chief complaint, number of po people involved, and safety issues at the scene of the incident or injury or illness. Um, the factors which influence your actions would be the time of day, obviously, the time of week, weather conditions. We need to be always mentally prepared for any situation we may find on scene. Sometimes you arrive on scene and there's nothing to do. Um, and the adrenaline just sits in your body and you feel frustrated. Other times you're going to arrive on scene and you don't know whether to run too hard, which person to treat first, things like that. Everything happens in a sequence, so we have to learn to keep our heads in a situation where um, everybody else seems to be losing theirs. If you come across a medical emergency, you're obviously going to contact dispatch using radios or cell phones or whatever, and come up and get help as soon as possible. We need to obviously park our vehicles in a safe position, fend off in case there's a um, chance of an accident, or we also want to make sure that we minimize traffic disruption and allow traffic to flow past us quite easily. Scan the scene and determine the extent of the incident, number of people injured, and possible hazards. Remember, safety first always. The type of hazards we're looking for in a crash scene or a crime scene. Um, always remember, if it's a crime scene, don't move anything. Maintain the integrity of the scene. Eh? Electrical wires, definitely a problem with uh, electrocution and shocking. Traffic in a high traffic zone or a high speed zone, it's always a danger to rescue us. Again, fuel spilt on the roads, whether it's diesel, petrol, gasoline, whatever it is. Unstable buildings or surfaces. Bad weathers, you never know where you are, whether it's exceptionally hot or exceptionally cold, blizzards, rain, okay, and obviously crowds. Crowds tend to become very worked up very quickly and it could turn into an incident at a drop of a hat. Okay, invisible hazards, electricity, always a problem. Hey? It's always is assumed that a wire is live. Um, biological hazards, things like um, your body substance isolation comes to mind where you have gloves, ventilators, masks, things like that, respirators. Hazardous materials, um, chemicals, uh, especially considering things like 
Um, it was a big thing in America at the moment is fentanyl. A lot of people being killed with fentanyl. It's an opiate. Uh, it's a extremely dangerous one at that. Uh, poisonous fumes, things like carbon monoxide poisoning, CO poisoning. Okay. If the scene is unsafe, please keep the people away until trained people have arrived to help hazmat and things like that. Always determine, look for clues, okay, which indicate may have, how, may, whatever may have happened and how the accident was caused. Ask the patient, the family, bystanders uh, for any additional information. Do not rule out any injury without conducting a secondary assessment. Okay, it takes precautions always, body substance isolation, gloves, masks if available. Um, um, consider using additional protection if it's necessary. Wash your hands thoroughly after contact with the patient or contaminated materials. Okay. Determine the number of patients that are injured. You may need to perform a triage to, to sort out um, in order of treatment. P1, P2, P3, P4, P1, critically injured patients, arterial bleeding, things like that. Um, P2, people that will survive if their treatment is put off slightly. Um, P3, walking wounded, those people that don't actually have to have um, medical care, they could do it a bandage or two. And then obviously P4, those people that are dead, positive signs of death, eh? Don't forget that decapitation, rigor mortis, decomposition, and lividity. Obviously, you can use the law enforcement services, fire department, whoever's there on site, um, who can help you control the scene to manage the resources correctly. The premise of a primary assessment is to identify life threats to the patient. Okay. Form a general impression, note the patient's sex, age, and determine whether the patient has experienced any trauma or illness. Uh, determine the patient's level of responsiveness or consciousness. Um, let's just have a look at this first of all. Um, is the patient breathing? Is the patient communicating with you? If you walk up to the patient and say, hello, my name is Glenn, can I help you? Patient says, yes, please, you've established, number one, he has an airway. Number two, he's alive, okay? Following this, we can then go on to check with patient's level of consciousness or responsiveness. Um, it's very important to introduce yourself at the scene and let everybody know that you know what you're talking about, okay? When we want to assess the patient's level of consciousness, uh, like I said, if you introduce yourself when he speaks back to you, he obviously has an airway. Um, if he doesn't speak back to you, you might have to do a sternum rub, chest rub, shoulder tap, shout loud, hello, hello, um, something like that to establish whether the patient is conscious or not. When we're looking at consciousness or levels of consciousness, responsiveness, we always use the AVPU scale, A standing for alert, does the patient recognize you? When you approach him, does he speak to you? Is he making sense? Verbal, does he respond? Well, his eyes may be closed. He responds verbally, um, talking to you or making an effort to make a sound when you're treating the patient. Pain response, this only arrives when you inflict a bit of pain on the patient. Sternum rub, nice firm shoulder tap, things like that. Obviously, if all the senses of the patients are de depressed or decreased, the patient would be unresponsive. He would have no feeling, he would have no hearing and clearly no vision. Unresponsiveness, determine whether the patient is breathing or not. If the patient is breathing and has a pulse, put the patient in a recovery position and monitor and or wait for help. Obviously, we can then do a secondary survey as well and determine, maybe try and determine what caused his unconsciousness in the first place. Okay, primary assess assessment is a, a rapid assessment. It's trying to identify life threats to the patient. What would life threats be? Um, uh, uh, arterial bleeds. Um, not breathing properly. 
inefficient breathing, not breathing enough. Okay, a very weak pulse, very rapid pulse. Airway that's blocked. As I said just now, if the patient talks to you, they obviously has an airway. The airway would be open. But is he breathing enough to sustain life? Is his quality of breath enough to sustain life? Remember, as soon as your oxygen saturation levels fall below a certain percentage, I think we established yesterday that it was 90%, uh, 94%, sorry, then we need to make some sort of adjustment to his breathing. Okay. Assess the airway. If the patient is alert and answers you, the airway is open. In an unconscious patient, you may have to open the airway. Our general way of opening the airway, if the patient is on his back, would be head tilt to chin lift maneuver. If the patient doesn't seem to have any spinal or cervical spine injuries, inspect the airway for foreign body and secretions. Okay, clear the airway if needed. If you need to suction the patient, remember when we suction a patient, there's four golden rules for suction. Never suction for longer than 10 to 15 seconds on an adult, 10 seconds on a child, 5 seconds on a baby. Only a suction what you can see, otherwise under direct vision. Only suction while withdrawing the catheter from the patient's mouth. And always beware of overstimulation of the vagus nerve. It will drop the patient's blood pressure and breathing rate, which might be bad if they're already in a compromised situation. Okay, we may need to insert an airway adjunct, in other words, an OP tube. Okay, if we need to put an OP tube, always remember, measure from the earlobe to the corner of the mouth or from the angle of the jaw to the center of the lips. When we insert the OP tube or a pharyngeal airway, um, we always put it in upside down, in other words, the point to the roof of the mouth. Once the patient is, the, the, the airway is completely into the mouth, we turn it 180 degrees, thus cradling the tongue at the back and keeping it forward and preventing it from falling backwards. It also acts as a bite block and allows us to suction past the patient can't close his mouth. It also can help with airway as well when we have to do artificial respiration. Okay, assessing the breathing and rate, we always check, look, listen and feel. Look to see if the air wall is moving up and down. Remember, once up, one down is one breath. So up and down, one, up and down, two. We more, we can, we can either uh, calculate the, the breathing rate by checking how many breaths in 15 seconds and multiply by four, or the old way, how many breaths in 30 seconds and multiply by two. Always when we're checking to a visual inspection on a secondary survey, look to see if you can see anything in the patient's mouth if it is open. The patient is not breathing, open the airway and perform rescue breathing. All right. If the patient is unconscious, check for a carotid pulse. If the patient is conscious, assess a radial pulse. Now that's on the arm. Check for patients any severe bleeding. Remember, bleeding, breathing, and all other injuries. Once we've assessed this pulse, the first thing you're going to see on a patient really is the skin color. When you see the skin color, you're going to notice that it is either pale or gray ashen, um, bright red, red spots, blotches, things like that. Okay. Or if it's going to be yellow, or if it's going to be any other color that's not looking normal. Okay. Also, assess the patient's temperature. Back of your hand is a good enough way to see, feel if it's hot or cold. And is it dry or wet? Is the patient sweating profusely? usually indicating something like shock, unless, of course, they've been working outside or exercising. All right, when assessing the patient's pulse, you see by the figures here, we're going to check, assess the circulation of the carotid pulse. Always feel for the pulse on your side of the body. Never lean over or work over your patient. Okay. In uh, assessment, like I said earlier, uh, pale white skin, light color, looking a bit uh, gray almost, indicates a lack of circulation to that part of the body. If it is flashed red, um, indicating uh, excessive circulation, <laughs> maybe it's hot, maybe it's carbon monoxide poisoning, things like that. Uh, hyperglycemia could give you some red flashed skin. 
If it's cyanotic, it's blue lips, blue fingernails, indicates lack of uh, oxygen, uh, problems in the airway, things like that. Cyanosis, eh? blue, cyan is a blue color. Yellow or jaundice, uh, indicating liver problems. Hepatitis A, B, C, D. Or obviously just a normal color skin. It's always good to see that. Eh? All right. Uh, elements of your report when you're updating the EMS units, age patient, uh, sex of the patient, chief complaint, the original reason why you were called to come and help. Okay, level of responsiveness, AVPU, alert, verbal, pain, and unresponsive, uh, breathing, um, vital signs, number of breaths per minute, rate, rhythm, and quality. Uh, airway, is it patent? In other words, is it an open airway? Uh, and circulation, obviously, when we talk about circulation, beats per minute, rate, rhythm, and quality. Is it shallow or 3D? Is it beating? Is it hard or pounding the, the, the pulse when you find it? Okay, all these type of things you need to be, take in mind. If if pulse is beating very hard, you're probably going to find the patient has elevated blood pressure, which may have caused him to be in the situation he is. Uh, perform all four steps of primary survey assessment and quickly uh, as you make contact with the patient. It's a, it's a quick, it's a rapid thing. You don't have time. If the patient is not breathing, you need to start CPR as soon as possible. Okay. History taking. Chief complaint. Um, we can't be allowed to be distracted by what's going on around you and other things of the, uh, uh, things you find of the patient. Patient could be injured from a fall due to a heart attack or something like that. The patient became unconscious, fell over and grazed himself. It might be bleeding slightly, but you can't be sure of these things until you've done a, a serious um, secondary survey head to toe inspection. Okay. Always determine the events leading up to the present situation. Determine the signs and symptoms of the current condition. Okay. Investigating the chief complaint. Uh, or you can always ask the patient exactly what happened. If the patient is conscious, and uh, you don't need to do CPR. Always serious injuries, illnesses, or surgeries, relevant last uh, things, um, medications, over-the-counter medications, allergies, things like that. Always use what we use is we use a sample history while doing a head-to-toe inspection. And if I provide the framework to ask further questions to the patient, ask the patient one question at a time, always allowing time to answer it, time to think about it. If the patient is not as uh, alert and conscious as you'd like, give him a little extra time. Repeat the question, never change the words though. Always ask the same thing over and over again. Listen carefully and make eye contact with the patient. That way you will know whether the patient is understanding your questions or not. If the patient is unconscious or, or senile, you can use uh, members of the family or friends to help you uh, gather as much information as possible. And always communicate this information over to the uh, responder that's coming to help you. When we look at your primary, your secondary survey, and we look at your sample history, S stands for signs and symptoms. Okay, um, signs, things that you can see, skin color, all your vital signs, pulse, uh, blood pressure, uh, glucose levels, HGT. Um, Symptoms is what the patient is going to complain about, the pain in his neck, the pain in his back, the dizziness, the feeling nauseous, things like that, okay? A stands for allergies. Anything the patient may be allergic to, whether it's food, food, uh, medications, things like that, anything that can indicate as to why the patient has suddenly been found themselves in this situation having anaphylactic shock or something like that. Medications we're looking at, we're always looking at chronic meds. Uh, most of the time, chronic meds uh, tell us more about the patient, about his, his, his history and things like that. We also ask about over-the-counter type medications, non-prescription things, and then supplements, vitamins, minerals, um, things like that that he's taking. P stands for previous or past medical history, things that are pertinent to the case, um, things like cancer, TB, uh, hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, 
hypertension and hypotension, things like that, that may indicate as to why the patient is in the situation he is. L, last meal or last oral intake. We always look and try and find out these type of things. Patient is diabetic. Have they taken enough uh, food and things in to sustain life, to keep them awake, to keep them alive? Um, is the patient having an anaphylactic allergic reaction or kind of is the uh, patient sick? Have they been poisoned? Do they have food poisoning? Why? What type of things have they eaten? Where have they eaten? How long ago have they eaten? If the patient may need to medical intervention or surgical intervention, um, we need to know when last they had something to eat, what, what they had consumed. Okay, E stands for events. What happened prior to the incident? Okay, um, uh, the things leading up to the accident, the things leading up to the illness, like I say, what happened? I was at a restaurant and I had a pizza. Pizza had peanut product in the base and the patient showed signs of anaphylactic shock with an allergic reaction and it's got a medical alert basis. And it states that he's allergic to nuts or nut products. All right, yes. So this is a physical examination. The secondary assessment is done to assess non-life-threatening conditions. The physical examination helps you locate and begin initial management and signs and symptoms of illness and injury. Remember, while we're doing these the the the, the, the signs and symptoms, secondary assessment, we're also doing a physical inspection of the patient at the same time. Right, when we're doing a physical inspection, I like to use the points in table 9.2. Dots, deformities, open injuries or open wounds, tenderness and swelling. If you do your sample history and you do the dots, okay, you will be able to completely assess the patient to the best of your ability. Do not be sidetracked and stop halfway through to treat a patient's injuries unless they're life-threatening. If you miss something that's life-threatening in the primary survey, you come up in the secondary survey, obviously you need to correct the situation or the patient will die. But if it's just so minor injuries, scrapes, bruises, cuts and grazes, maybe a broken bone or dislocated toe or something like it, never stop your secondary assessment. Always complete your assessment and then go back and in treat the injuries. Okay, hopefully by then you will have some assistance and you can continue with these things. Always remember that while doing a primary assessment and a secondary assessment, um, we need to make notes, mental notes, voice notes recorded on your on your phone. Um, if you need to be, if you need to, you need to you need to do things, please ask the patient if you may take pictures of injuries. Otherwise, make assessment and notes and do a paper assessment or drawings and things like that of the patients. It's easy to remember. It's easy to um, pass over to ambulance staff, things like that. When they do arrive, if you can just send them the pictures and send them the voice notes and things on what the patient is. Remember, if you know first that there might be spinal injuries involved in the patient, we need to stabilize the head and spine and minimize the patient's movement during the exam. In fact, anytime you see a head injury, expect to find a um, C spine injury as well. All right, perform the part. We need to perform specific area exams on specific areas of the body um, in order to um, gauge some things. If the patient has got a mechanism of injuries, um, broken bones, things like that, always remember you need to stabilize uh, bones and that before moving patients and doing other types of assessments. All right, once you've done your um, initial secondary survey, your patient's vital signs, breathing rate, 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Okay, um, check quality and rhythm and rate. Pulse, the same thing. What is the speed, the, the rate of the pulse? Okay, how fast is it? Check for rate, rhythm and quality. Radial pulse. Okay, if you can't find a radial pulse, always do a carotid pulse just to see if the patient is breathing and have a pulse rate. Okay, normal adult pulse at rest, 60 to 100 beats per minute. 
um, in a very serious athletic type person, it could be greatly reduced, all those check rhythm and quality. We can also check for capillary refill. In other words, we squeeze the nail bed for five seconds. When the nail bed is squeezed for five seconds, we release it, goes from white to pink in, two seconds again. There we go. So we squeeze the patient's nail bed firmly between your thumb and forefinger, so it looks pale. We release it and count two seconds, and the patient's capillary refill should go from white to pink, indicating a normal capillary refill, good circulation. Blood pressure, if you have a machine that's capable of of doing blood pressure, if you know how to use the old way of doing things. All that determine whether the patient's blood pressure is, is normal. Average adult male blood pressure, uh, healthy male, 120 over uh, 120 over 80, uh, female 110 over 70, use it as an average. Um, obviously, everybody's different. Each um, patient has to be assessed on their his or her own criteria. Okay, skin conditions, color, skin color, skin temperature, whether it's warm or dry, pink, sweaty, things like that. We can also check pupil size. Is it um, response to light? Is it equal? Or is there a difference in pupil size, things like that, which may be in, uh, indicating a head injury? Remember, um, the patient's left is your right, and the opposite side of the brain it controls that side of the head. So if the right eye is not responding to light properly, then the left part of the brain might have an injury in it. Check the skull, things like that, for blow mark, con concussion marks or kick marks, bruises, open wounds, things like that. Né? Have a look at the eyes. Those are normal pupils. Those are dilated pupils and constricted pupils. They must at all times be equal. Otherwise, there is a problem. We continue to reassess these things, uh, levels of consciousness, as we're going along, as the pupil, as as the the, the, the the patient waits on the arrival of the ambulance. We keep checking, assessing patients. Um, people go into shock very quickly. So we need to reassess the patient. In a stable patient, we're always going to be checking the ABCs and um, things like that every 15 minutes in an unstable patient, every five minutes, but we're going to continue to reassess the patient and make sure that our treatment of the patient is actually working. And there we go. And that um, we don't need to change our treatment or reassess our conditions and what we're doing. Remember always when handing over, patient age, sex possible, um, history of the incident, what you found, the chief complaint, what was the problem when you arrived? Why were you caught to it? Patient's level of response. Okay, how you found the patient, how he was lying, where he was lying, what your initial vital signs were. Okay, results of your secondary assessment, any pertinent medical conditions from the sample history, always hand over a full sample history. And obviously any interventions you did, treatments, whether it was oxygen or CPR or just helping him use his meet a dose inhaler for an asthma incident, things like that you need to, obviously um, relay back to the EMS. Okay, patients, you can just classify into two main categories, illness, nature of illness, and trauma or mechanism of injury. Patient assessment sequence can you use to examine patients who have experienced illness or trauma or both. Sometimes a patient becomes weak, dizzy, falls down the steps, ends up breaking a bone or something like that. It was an illness that caused the patient to fall in the first place, loss of balance, things like that, but the resulting injuries from his fall could be a lot worse. Okay. When examining medical patients, follow the basic assessment sequence. When caring for trauma patients, perform a secondary assessment before taking a medical history. Okay. Avoid jumping to conclusions. That's not a very good thing to do. Do a thorough assessment before you take a look at any possible causes or reasons for illness or injury.